Welcome back to the podcast. This is now the third in a series of uh, monologues that I'm doing about sex and love. I'd anticipated doing two. So in the first, I spoke about Aristophanes and Lucretius. And in the second, I was going to speak about Freud and Plato, but I got into so much detail about Freud that I think uh, that was better left as a single episode. And so here I am now doing a third episode And this one will be entirely about Plato. Just to summarize what's gotten us to this point, these four authors I'm understanding as giving us a variety of views about sex and love, uh, especially when it comes to two criteria. Uh, The most important is the question of whether sex and love are meaningful. And Aristophanes gave us a view that sex and love are very meaningful. And in a way, it's, it's a universal meaning because everybody is doing the same thing, namely looking to unite bodily and spiritually with their other half, the romantic myth of the one that's destined for you. But it's also a particular story because the person that's destined to be your other half is different from the person who's destined to be my other half. Secondly, Lucretius thought and argued that sex and love were meaningless. These were bodily disruptions, Um, that everything in the end is meaningless because it's just a bunch of atoms floating in in a void, but that sex and love are especially meaningless because these are random disturbances in our body and images that float through the air that collide with each other and create strange fantasies in our minds, some of which cause wet dreams, at least in adolescent boys, and that the best thing to do with this phenomenon of sexual desire is to satisfy it in the the way that causes the least pain, which he thought was either promiscuity or marriage to somebody who is clean and obedient. Freud, who was the sole subject of the second episode in this, this little series, thinks that sex and love are very meaningful, but that their meaning is almost entirely idiosyncratic, in particular to you. So he described several stages, five, that I went into detail in last episode that everybody um, has to grapple with in their own life one way or another, but that everybody has a different trajectory through those five stages. And so your particular set of sexual uh, fantasies and desires and ultimately behaviors or decisions not to behave that way, those are clues manifest content, if you will, that testify to a history that gave you a particular uh, constitution, a particular type of soul. And it's not simply a story about which parts of the body you like to use or like to interact with in another person, uh, although it it does have a lot to do with that. But uh, most importantly, it's about the cognitive style of your soul, uh, the way that your particular mind relates to other minds and people. Because if you are an oral person, you are a black and white thinker who, uh, for whom you're either with us or against us, to simplify. If you're an anal person, you are rigid and controlling. You see human relationships as relationships of domination and submission. If you are a genital or edible person, you are caught up always in in one love triangle or another. You see uh, human relationships as uh, rivalries uh, for the affection or attention or rewards uh, given by another person, and and you have to to, um, beat out somebody else. If you are latent, if you're in the latency period, if that's characteristic of your, um, your style, then you will um, you know, experience pure affection um, that is repressed uh, erotic desire. And if you make it all the way through to, the, to puberty without any fixation, you will either fuse that affectionate love with the sexual desires of the earlier stages and have what, what Freud is implicitly thinking of as mature sexuality, that encompasses all of the uh, previous stages into one um, to one set of fantasies and 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 behaviors that will ultimately be copulative for the sake of reproduction, but will include other things as foreplay and as 
concomitants. So you'll, you'll be with somebody that you love and you'll find that person sexually attractive and you'll have children together, but that you'll still enjoy kissing and, and, and other things on that menu of desires. And you will be able to go into modes of oral thinking when that's appropriate. Sometimes you just simply do have to accept or reject something. You do have to think in black and white terms. You have to make a, a decision. Other times you'll be able to be rigid and controlling. You might submit on one occasion and dominate on another occasion when that's appropriate. But you can go out of that and go into a more rivalrous attitude to people. That will be characteristic of your Oedipal components. Or you can go into uh, a purely affectionate, non-sexual relationship the way you would have to in, in many professional contexts, and so on. So that is a summary then of Freud's account of sex and love. And what I want to do in this episode is present Plato's account of sex and love. And of course, Plato's a rich, complicated thinker who writes many dialogues, several of them on love. Uh, I'm here going to talk only about the symposium and even within that dialogue, only the speech that is put in the mouth of Socrates. As so often the, the views of Socrates seem to be the views of Plato. It's not always that straightforward, but for our purposes in this case, I, I'm going to call it Plato's view. It's a little more complicated than that, though, because Socrates in this dialogue is giving a speech that he is reporting was given to him by a priestess named Diotima, honored of the god. And um, there are all, all sorts of ways of thinking about the fact that Plato is giving us a view of love that ultimately goes back to a priestess, that is to a woman, uh, especially when you think about how this dialogue, the symposium, was a discussion of love and sex by an, an entire cast of men. Uh, and one of the premises of most of the speeches was that the love between two men was better than the love between a man and a woman. So here is this priestess whom Socrates treats as uh, a teacher, moral teacher for himself, because she's going to tell him the ways of love. And I, I can't present the entire thing, but I will summarize her basic views of desire before, and, and love before uh, giving an explanation of Plato's theory of forms, which I think is necessary to understand this view ultimately, and then I'll talk about the so-called ladder of love. So Diotima um, argues that desire is always for something that is not possessed, so that love is a relationship that the subject has with an object that isn't yet possessed, and so there's always a lack in love. And love, she says is not for the whole and she has here in mind the view of Aristophanes that occurs as an earlier speech in the dialogue and that I talked about two episodes ago now where Aristophanes thought that when one person loves another what they're doing is uh, finding a wholeness that they lacked when they weren't with that other person uh, but Diotima observes I think uh, quite decisively that love can't be for the whole because sometimes we're whole and we want to be apart. So her example is when you, um, you know, have a, a, a limb that's become diseased, if you have a gangrenous arm, uh, you want the surgeon to remove the arm. I mean, ideally, you'd like to keep your arm, but only if it's healthy. If, if it's a choice between living without the gangrenous arm or dying with the gangrenous arm, you have the, the arm amputated so that something is more important than being whole, and that is being in a good state. And this is her argument that what love is a desire for is not to be whole, but to have a good state. It's and in the terms of the dialogue where it's discussion of beauty uh, as the object of love, love is a desire for beautiful things, not necessarily things that uh, are our own, the way the other half of ourselves was our own, but rather um, beautiful things as such, some of which aren't our own. And since she assumes that all good things are beautiful, she goes back and forth between the desire for beautiful things, the desire for good things. And it's not simply that we want to have a good thing you know, for a moment, 
but that we want to have it forever. And this uh, has her arguing that love wants to give birth in beauty. And here she's thinking more about um, men, the male perspective, not surprisingly, but also a reproductive theory that uh, Plato seems to have held, which is that in the male semen is already the the baby in, in a small form, and that the female uterus is not that the that the female doesn't contribute any genetic material to the um, the production of the baby. She rather contributes only the uterus, and that insemination is the male putting the little baby, namely the semen, into the uterus where it can then grow. The analogy that they were working with, those who held this theory in antiquity, was that reproduction of human beings is like uh, growing plants in a field. The field is like the uterus. It supplies the nutrients, the soil, and the plant is simply the seed that is planted by the farmer into the ground and draws the nutrients from the ground into itself so that it develops into a a full-fledged plant. And there the male contributes the semen, which just means seed in Greek, which already has all the genetic material. And the, the woman contributes the, the, simply the environment for it. Now, this was a debate in antiquity between the, what was called the one-seed theory and the two-seed theory. So Plato here is a proponent of the false one-seed theory that women don't con- uh, contribute genetic material, but simply the nutrients to grow the, the baby that's already in the semen. Uh, Aristotle was another one seed man. Uh, the problem for that theory is obviously why is it that children sometimes look like their mother? <laughs> that was the argument for the two seed theory. And uh, there were all sorts of crazy explanations that I don't need to get into now. But uh, Galen, to his credit, was a proponent of the two seed theory, uh, which turned out to be true, as we know now that the, the woman contributes an ovum and the male contributes the semen and the, uh, the embryo is a product of the union of the two seeds, that is, of the semen with the ovum. In any case, when Diotima says, love wants to give birth in beauty, what she's thinking of is, in the background, that one seed, that false one seed theory, and also the male perspective, that the the male feels uh, a a swelling desire, as she says, um, to put the seed that he carries into something beautiful into a beautiful field so it can it can grow well so she's got these two views of love um, that she's playing with and and not not rejecting one or the other one is that love is a desire for beautiful or good things not simply for now but forever and also this is more description as i say of the male perspective it wants to give birth in beauty now what are beautiful things and this of course, depends on the person you ask. And she's aware, uh, Plato's aware, I should say, that there are some people who find bodies beautiful. And if you recall an earlier episode in this series of podcasts, or if you recall having read Plato, his Republic, or even his Phaedrus, another dialogue on love, where the soul is analyzed, uh, the soul has three parts and there are three people three types of people according to which part of the soul is dominant there are people in whom the appetitive part is dominant and their choices are largely determined by their appetitive desires uh, rather than the desires of the other parts of the soul Uh, there's another part of the soul is the spirited part that wants honor and and people in whom that's dominant they choose honor when um, having to choose between being honored and satisfying an appetite, they'll choose to be honored. And finally, the third highest part of the soul in Plato's estimation is um, the love of truth or the real good or love of wisdom, philosophy. And people in whom that part is dominant will choose wisdom uh, when given a choice between that and honor and, and, and some appetitive satisfaction. So what do people find beautiful? Well, Appetitive people find bodies most beautiful. And in this respect, they're like animals. Uh, And since love is wanting to have good things forever, 
because bodies are ephemeral, lovers of bodies, namely appetitive people, can't uh, achieve forever, but reproduction in a body gives them a substitute. And even animals uh, are seeking the eternal, wanting to have the beautiful or the good forever by reproducing themselves in bodies. This is a simulacrum or imitation of eternity. The animal produces a copy of itself by giving birth in beauty. Uh, one raccoon comes to another raccoon and finds it beautiful. The male finds the, be- the female beautiful and inseminates the female. And out of her comes a reproduction of, of himself or herself, however the theory is supposed to go. And uh, then that's a way for the, the animal, the raccoon in this case, to have the beautiful forever. It's obviously uh, an inadequate way to achieve eternity, and that allows Plato to, uh, and Diotima, I should say, to move to the next choice, the next object of beauty. What else do people find beautiful? Well, some find honor most beautiful or desirable. These are the spirited people, the auxiliaries, the soldiers in Plato's Republic that I discussed in an earlier episode. And in order to achieve the kind of immortality or eternity that they can they can achieve, the, the simulacrum of it that they can achieve, they have to do noble deeds that will be the subjects of stories. And those stories can outlive their body and it can outlive their descendants' bodies. And those stories can be told for hundreds, if not thousands of years, the way stories of Achilles were told in Plato's time several hundred years after um, the events of the Trojan War, if there ever were uh, those events. So these people uh, have a superior love of beauty because they want to have the beautiful and good things forever, and they don't get it forever, but they get something more enduring than those who seek it only in bodily reproduction. Finally, there are those who love wisdom, the philosophers who are dominated by the love of the real good or the truth. And these people are the only ones who achieve true um, true communion with beauty forever because the objects of the things that they find beautiful, I should say the object, the one object, the only object that they find beautiful is a form, particularly the form of beauty. And here I have to interrupt the account to give a quick uh, explanation of Plato's theory of forms. Not a defense necessarily, but just an explanation of it. We find many things beautiful. So, you know, give give a list of things that, I don't want to say we in the sense everyone listening is going to agree that all of these things are beautiful, but take a list that most people find beautiful just so that you can imagine that something like this is true for the moment, even if you don't accept it. Particular a uh, piece of art like um, Michelangelo's David that many people think is beautiful and a particular piece of music like uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and particular natural phenomenon like, say, Mount Everest and Niagara Falls and, uh, and on and on. <laughs> we need a list that is of sufficient diversity that uh, you can see Plato's point. Imagine... Complete the list for yourself of things that you find beautiful, and, and, and the, the argument will be a little more compelling. Well, if those are truly beautiful things, and not simply things that I happen to find beautiful, uh, that's why I'm trying to get a list of things that most people agree are beautiful, because it's always possible to say to Plato in this vein, in this I shouldn't say in this vein, I should say um, on this subject, it's always possible to say to Plato, Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. You know, any list that somebody gives is going to be simply what they find beautiful. And that says more about them than it does about the things. That will bypass what Plato's about to say. Plato's assuming here that there is a truth about which things are beautiful and which things aren't. Uh, similarly, there is a truth about which things are good and which things are bad, which things are just and which things are unjust. But let's just focus on the beautiful for the moment. So we have to make it a conditional argument for the listeners who, who don't accept truth about beauty. If there are things that are beautiful 
and other things that are not beautiful, then there's got to be something that the beautiful things share that make them part of that set of beautiful things. And that thing won't be shared by the things that are not part of that set. The non-beautiful things will not have this thing, uh, beauty, that the beautiful things share. Because in order to be beautiful, the beautiful things have to share something, and that is going to be, quite simply, beauty. Now that sounds trivial, and it is so far, except that that thing that all beautiful things share, assuming again that beauty is not simply in the eye of the beholder, but there is a set of things that really are beautiful, that thing that the beautiful things must share in order to be beautiful, namely beauty, here we'll give it a capital B, it's got to be a peculiar sort of thing because the beautiful things are all over the world. So beauty can't be in any particular place, especially because a beautiful thing can appear anywhere. Um, so Beethoven's Fifth Symphony can be played almost anywhere. And if beauty can appear in Houston when the Houston Symphony Orchestra plays Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and then it can appear in Toronto when the Toronto Symphony Orchestra plays, well, beauty has to be able to show up in Houston or Toronto as the occasion demands. It can't be always in Kansas City. It has to be able to be in Houston and also in Toronto. In fact, those two symphony orchestras can be playing that piece at the same time. So beauty would have to be in both places. It can't be in any particular place. Similarly, it can't be in any particular time. Uh, Helen of Troy was beautiful, and she existed, if she did, in whatever, a thousand BC, and uh, Michelangelo David is beautiful, and it exists now in Florence. So beauty can't simply exist now because then it couldn't be there in Helen of Troy in 1000 BC, and it couldn't exist in 1000 BC alone. Otherwise, it couldn't exist now or however long the David has existed for however, however many centuries, five or so now. So just as with space, this beauty with a capital B can't be in any particular time. So as I say, this argument that is provisional, we have to assume that it's not the case that things are simply beautiful in the eye of the beholder, but that there's a truth about which things are beautiful and which things aren't. This argument begins as a trivial statement that the beautiful things have to share some one thing, beauty, give it a capital B to make the distinction easy to track, that's trivial so far. But when we observe the properties of this thing, capital B, beauty, that, that it has to have in order to play the role we've just given it, well, it can't be in any particular place and it can't be in any particular time. Another way of putting that is it's outside of space and it's outside of time. Now that's significant because now we'll call it by the name that it's given in this dialogue and in other Platonic dialogues, the form of beauty, capital B if you like. Plato will often just say beauty, but sometimes use a Greek equivalent of the word we translate now as form, which by the way means beauty in Latin. This is Cicero's translation, forma. Um, this is significant because now this thing, in this case, the form of beauty, there are other forms, especially the form of the good, but uh, in this dialogue, it's the form of the beautiful or beauty. It is outside space and time. It's not sensible. And we can only approach it, if at all, with our minds. Uh, it's not material. It's not sensible. It's spiritual, if you like. It's accessible only to our souls, only to our souls insofar as they are thinking. Now, remember... Diotima observes that even animals uh, have a desire for beauty, and they too want to give birth in the beautiful, and they too want to possess beautiful things forever. But the only way that they can do that in a very imperfect way is through bodily reproduction. Humans, some are like that too. The soldiers and other glory seekers, they seek an imitation of beauty uh, in honor. The only real beauty, in other words, not seeking beautiful things, not seeking a beautiful victory, not seeking a beautiful body, not seeking Helen of Troy, not seeking 
the David, uh, not seeking Mount Everest, a flower, a waterfall, whatever, but seeking beauty itself, the real beauty, not the images of beauty, but the thing that all the images of beauty share. That alone, that's the true love of beauty. And the benefit of that is not only that the object is real in a way that the images are imitations, but also it's truly eternal. It's outside time as well as being outside space. That's what love is really about. And so with that in the background, I want to read a stretch of text from the symposium. This is Diotima's description of what's subsequently called the ladder of love, how a soul, a person, a lover can mature from loving inferior things like bodies to loving the highest object of all, the form of the beautiful. So she says, Even you, Socrates, could probably come to be initiated into these rites of love. But as for the purpose of these rites, when they are done correctly, that is the final and highest mystery. And I don't know if you are capable of it. I myself will tell you, she said, and I won't stint any effort and you must try to follow if you can. So remember, Diotima is a priestess, and she's here initiating Socrates, the philosopher, into the mysteries of love. She says, A lover who goes about this matter correctly must begin in his youth to devote himself to beautiful bodies. First, if the leader leads aright, and here her model is pedagogical. She's imagining a teacher or a leader who's training someone how to love. And since the summit of this training is going to be philosophy, this is not just a training in love, it's a training in, in truth. They go together. First, if the leader leads aright, he, that is the follower, the student, should love one body and beget beautiful ideas there. So this is this is a chaste relationship. Even you know this is characteristic of Plato. He's taking on the homoerotic culture of the elites of this time who thought that the love of boys was superior to the love of women, but it's not sexual. It's rather that the teacher takes on the beautiful boy as his student, and instead of having sex with him, which was advocated in earlier speeches, rather he will beget beautiful ideas there. And the teacher will have the boy love one body. So there's the uh, romantic fixation on one person that we saw in Aristophanes, uh, although here it's, um, it's it, well, I was going to say it's purely sexual, but it's not because she's saying that they'll beget, he'll beget beautiful ideas there. But what's interesting is that the this is the first stage, namely loving one body. She goes on, then he should realize that the beauty of any one body is brother to the beauty of any other, and that if he is to pursue beauty of form... He'd be very foolish not to think that the beauty of all bodies is one and the same. So after having loved one body, this student, and that's the first stage, moves to a second stage, which is loving many bodies. And once you know the theory of forms that I summarize very quickly in the discussion of the, the many beautiful things that are made beautiful by that one form of beauty, you see why moving to the love of many beautiful bodies is superior to loving simply one beautiful body because it's easier to see the one thing that actually transcends all the many when you don't confuse that with one material body. When he grasps this, he must become a lover of all beautiful bodies, and he must think that this wild gaping after just one body is a small thing and despise it. So just as Lucretius was contemptuous of romantic love, the fixation on one beloved, because of the dangers of sadism and, and worry and jealousy and ruining his reputation and spending his fortune. So too, for different reasons, Plato here is critical of romantic love. But for, as I say, for very different reasons, not because of that list of worries. The, the real problem is metaphysical. That is that that person, this primitive student just at the beginning of his education in erotic matters, won't graduate to 
the love of the form of the beautiful. He'll be simply too fixated on one material body. He needs to move up to loving all beautiful bodies as a stage towards loving the form that makes them beautiful. After this, he must think that the beauty of people's souls is more valuable than the beauty of their bodies, so that if someone is decent in his soul, even though he is scarcely blooming in his body, our lover must be content to love and care for him and to seek to give birth to such ideas as will make young men better. The love of the soul is superior to the love of the body in this, for the same reason that the, um, the person who loves honor, for example, is superior to the person who loves appetite. There, so there are deep psychological reasons behind this that uh, I explained in an earlier episode about the, the tripartite soul. The result is that our lover will be forced to gaze at the beauty of activities and laws and to see that all this is akin to itself, with the result that he will think that the beauty of bodies is a thing of no importance. So, first stage, loving one body. Second stage, loving many bodies. Third stage, loving a soul rather than bodies because the soul is superior to the body. Fourth stage is loving activities and laws because those are the things that make beautiful souls beautiful they are the cause behind that and so now this lover has graduated to this fourth stage where he's in love with laws because those are the things that make beautiful souls beautiful after customs or laws he must move on to various kinds of knowledge now here's a fifth stage what is it that makes beautiful laws and customs beautiful, it's that they're founded on a knowledge of beauty. And so he'll love knowledge or the sciences. This is, however, the fifth stage. This is, this is the penultimate, but not the final stage. The result is that he will see the beauty of knowledge and be looking mainly not at beauty in a single example, as a servant would who favored the beauty of a little boy or a man or a single custom. Being a slave, of course, he's low and small-minded. But the lover is turned to the great sea of beauty. And gazing upon this, he gives birth to many gloriously beautiful ideas and theories in unstinting love of wisdom. This is philosophy, love of wisdom in the Greek. Until, having grown and been strengthened there, he catches sight of such knowledge, and it is the knowledge of such beauty. Now, there's an ellipsis in the translation and Diotima breaks off to encourage Socrates to pay a special attention because here comes the final revelation. Try to pay attention to me, she said, as best you can. You see, the man who has been thus far guided in matters of love, who has beheld beautiful things in the right order and correctly, is coming now to the goal of loving. Now remember, love was defined early in the speech as the desire for beautiful things and to have them forever. But once you understand the theory of forms, the thing that makes beautiful things beautiful is the form of beauty, and it's eternal. So that is the ultimate uh, goal of loving. All of a sudden, he will catch sight of something wonderfully beautiful in its nature. That, Socrates, is the reason for all his earlier labors. So now we're at the sixth or final stage. This is the form of beauty. First, it always is and neither comes to be nor passes away. This is the timeless, eternal characteristic of the form of beauty. Neither waxes nor wanes. Second, it is not beautiful this way and ugly that way, nor beautiful at one time and ugly at another, nor beautiful in relation to one thing and ugly in relation to another, nor is it beautiful here but ugly there, as it would be if it were beautiful for some people and ugly for others. This is characteristic of all the many beautiful things that for some people they don't seem beautiful to others they do in some lights they do and other times not helen of troy after her death became a corpse and wasn't as beautiful as she was when she was alive and and young so this is plato's explanation for how people get confused to think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder they focus on these many beautiful things and think that the relativity of the beauty, the experience of beauty that Plato would grant is characteristic of those beautiful things, that that's the final thing there is to say about beauty. Plato would say, yes, those things and their beauty is relative, but 
for them to count as beautiful at all. And, and this isn't just a caprice. There has to be something that they have that the things they're not being counted beautiful in any way don't have. And that's the form of the beautiful. Nor will the beautiful appear to him in the guise of a face or hands or anything else that belongs to the body. It will not appear to him as one idea or one kind of knowledge. It is not anywhere in another thing as in an animal or in earth or in heaven or in anything else, but here's characteristic Plato, itself, by itself, with itself. This is the form of beauty. It's alone, and it's not made impure by mixture with anything else, and it's accompanied by itself alone. It is not sullied by anything. It's just pure beauty. It, it is always, she says, one in form, and all the other beautiful things share in that in such a way that when those others come to be or pass away, this does not become the least bit smaller or greater, nor suffer any change. Best analogy I have to forms um, when I'm teaching is numbers. So if you think that there are two books on your desk and there are two candles in that holder and there are two coffee mugs on this table and so on, what we have are many twos, but... If there really are twos and not it's not simply a figment of my imagination or it's not simply relative, it's not simply in the eye of me as a beholder that there are twos, but there really are twos here, pairs, then there has to be something too that they all share, and that has to be the number two, which exists outside of space and time. It's the same argument that I gave uh, on Plato's behalf for the form of the beautiful. So think about the number two when Plato says of the form of the beautiful. This does not become the least bit smaller or greater, nor suffer any change when beautiful things come to be or pass away. So to the number two, I can create an, a new pair by putting these two pieces of paper in front of me together. Well, now there's a new two, but the, the number two has not been diminished anyway, in, in any way. It remains as two as it ever was outside of space and time. That's what he's saying about the form of the beautiful. It remains purely beautiful, and it's undiminished no matter how many beautiful things appear. It always has enough beauty to supply to those things to make them beautiful. So when someone rises by these stages, those six stages uh, that I mentioned, or five to the final stage, through loving boys correctly and begins to see this beauty, he has almost grasped his goal. This is what it is to go aright or be led by another into the mystery of love. One goes always upwards for the sake of this beauty, starting out from beautiful things and using them like rising stairs from one body to two and from two to all beautiful bodies, then from beautiful bodies to beautiful customs and from customs to learning beautiful things. And from these lessons he arrives in the end at this lesson, which is learning of this very beauty so that in the end he comes to know just what it is to be beautiful. A critic, I mean, a sympathetic scholar of ancient philosophy, Martha Nussbaum, whom I admire in, in many ways, uh, she made a criticism of this passage in a paper a long time ago uh, that this is um, a false view of love because as she understood it, the student as he graduates will leave behind the earlier stages so that if he loved one person, um, and that person's body early on, then he moves to multiple bodies. Well, he just won't love that one body anymore. He'll just move on to the many bodies. Or once he's moved on to the soul, he just won't care about bodies anymore. I don't think that's what Plato's saying. I think what Plato's saying is that as the student rises, yes, the higher stages are superior to the earlier stages, and loving a soul is indeed better than loving bodies, but that it's not that the student stops loving bodies, but rather loves them for what they are, which is inferior objects to the superior objects. And in fact, seen in that light, uh, you know, adopting Plato's point of view at any rate, the student learns to love bodies better than he did when he focused on them exclusively, because now he can uh, love them for what they are. And I mean, quite practically, he won't be disappointed by them. Bodies corrupt. And 
in a way that souls don't or not as quickly and souls corrupt in a way that ultimately the form of the beautiful beautiful does not and if what we're looking for is to have beauty forever only the form of the beautiful will satisfy that longing whereas the inferior objects uh, will will disappoint us if we think that they are the proper object of our love but if we put our um, if we invest our energies, if we focus our, if we make the object of our drive to put it in Freudian terms, the form of the beautiful, uh, we won't be disappointed and we won't become resentful of those inferior objects for disappointing us. And now with that love satisfied, we can then love those inferior objects better because our love won't be tainted by resentment. So let me now step back from this platonic account and compare it with the others. Well, there's the obvious criticism of Aristophanes that, that Diotima makes, uh, that we don't look for uh, another self, the, the one for us, and that if we were to be fixated at that stage, we would become resentful and disappointed, and we would grap, grapple, grasp something, someone, thinking that we'd found happiness, when in fact we might, in fact, be grasped grasping something like a, a gangrenous arm that we would be better off amputating so that we could be start climbing a ladder. So that the Aristophanic view of love, that what comes into our culture, especially in Hollywood movies, is the romantic view of love, that that's quite dangerous, that's going to cause resentment in the way that Madame Bovary becomes resentful of her the objects of her uh, romantic devotion in that prophetic, insightful novel. As for Lucretius, um, Lucretius's worldview is just so alien to Plato because for Lucretius, the cosmos is devoid of meaning, and Plato sees the cosmos as the product of um, the forms, ultimately the form of the good, which, which is generative, like the form of the beautiful, so that so-called material things, things that we see and feel and touch and so on, those are images of the more real beautiful and good, which give purpose to the things that they produce insofar as they're products of that uh, highest purpose. So Plato's critique of Lucretius would have to start with Lucretius's basic premises uh, of the cosmos. And, and I think Plato would say, well, no wonder you think sex and love are meaningless. You, you, you're looking at the world in an upside down way. Uh, all the meaning has fallen out because you've turned the world upside down. To Freud, as I say, I, Freud and Plato are peculiar allies in this contest of four philosophers about the meaning of sex and love because they both think that it's a very meaningful facet of life, in fact, the most meaningful facet of life because it's through sex and love, especially love uh, for, for Plato, who, who doesn't take away the sensual aspects but does think that even when you're in love with the body that, that all you're going to do is generate good ideas in it. Uh, so speaking only of love now, that both Plato and Freud think that love is the, the royal road to uh, self-knowledge and uh, the truth about yourself. The difference is that for Plato, the truth is going to be the same for you as it is for me. It's the form of the beautiful or the form of the good. Whereas for Freud, although there are some universal stages that we've all gone through, it's your task to figure out how you went through those stages and my task to figure out how I went through those stages and no universal description of the human condition or philosophy as such is going to give either of us the answer. We each have to build our, our bridge across the river of life, as, as Nietzsche puts it in uh, Schopenhauer as educator. So thinking about Hang the DJ... Um, I think that this movie would be uh, uh, regrettable, to say the least, from Plato's point of view, because the romantic uh, assumptions, the Aristophanic story that's really behind this, is, uh, is, is more dangerous for Plato than even Lucretius thought it to be dangerous. And whereas Lucretius would have seen value in the meaningless sexual short-term relationships that Amy's subjected to from the perspective of the film. Whereas Lucretius would have thought, well, that's at least 
a good part because she's learning not to fall in love, or she should have learned that. Uh, Plato would think that's a disaster. You know, the last thing you want is to to dull the ardor of your search for beauty. Um, no, you want to increase your ardor, but you want to direct it towards something that will actually satisfy it. And there's nothing in Hang the DJ like the form of the beautiful. In fact, there's nothing in any Black Mirror episode that's anything like Plato's forms. And so while Plato is very helpful for understanding many of these episodes, especially the, the cave uh, with which I began, they're, I don't want to say anti-Platonic. I mean, many of them could be supplemented with uh, Platonic uh, additions, but that uh, there's nothing in most of them to, to match what Plato thinks the purpose of life is. Mm-hmm.